So thank you very much for um, hosting me and for coming to listen to this talk. What I'm going to do, the structure is going to be, I'm going to describe a little bit what our brain center is about. And then I'll share with you some of the enormous enthusiasm of doing neuroscience today. We have incredible tools that we didn't have until recently that are really changing how we understand the brain and are completely uh, revising the way that we can look into treatments and including treatments for addiction that uh, only became available in the past few months and they're still in the stage of great promise. We don't know if that promise will really succeed fully to the extent that it looks now or, uh, you know, if, uh, like many other treatments that it uh, becomes less exciting throughout time, but right now this is a very exciting time and what my objective here, I'm not going to make life easy for you, I know you're all after a day at work and a glass of wine now, but still, <laughs> I, I'm not going to make it easy. I want you to leave here with a different brain than, from, than the brain you had when you came in. It's going to be modified, you're going to have, it's going to be rewired in many ways. And my objective, and I'll need you to help make sure that I get there along the way, is that you understand the state of the art of what we know today about how addiction happens and how we can use this knowledge for therapy. And uh, it's going to be technical, but you know, I'm pretty sure that, that we'll be able to do it. We'll be able to succeed. Um, so, as Julie said, I'm at the Edmund and Lily Safra for Brain Sciences, which is a relatively new initiative at the Hebrew University. It builds off many of the strengths of the Hebrew University. Uh, and we are hopefully very, very, very soon moving in to our new building, which uh, kind of defines what ELSEC is about. It was a, a utopian dream and it turned into a reality. This uh, uh, building was inaugurated very recently. And for those, and, and I'll show a short movie about the inauguration, but just to give you kind of a feel for what type of center I'm talking about, um, we're a, a center that's built around collaboration and social spirit and uh, social uh, view both inside towards ourselves, so very collaborative, and outside towards society. Giving talks like these in many places around the world and in Israel, uh, being involved in the community with a very high level of commitment to teaching. And in that sense, we're very similar to what Israel is, the good part of what Israel is about, the bad part. You know, if you, if you want, we can talk about that in the Q&A, but uh, let's talk about the good part. Uh, so Israel is built around this idea, this very big notion, this very big concept that was then fulfilled by people that felt a commitment to the cause. And that's uh, really what brought this uh, utopian dream into reality. Israel is uh, built around the social spirit and the spirit of uh, giving to the other. And I, here is where I, I want to share a bit of my personal story, why I'm at this brain center doing science there and not anywhere else in the world. Uh, and this is due to my father, who was born in Poland in uh, 1921, a long time ago. And he came at the age of 15 to Israel on a boat with a group of children his age, left his family behind because he was pursuing uh, Zionism, this fantastic notion that they had at the time, and he wanted to build a kibbutz in Israel. And he came and they established a, uh, he, he learned how to do farming, which was very different than the education he had in Poland, and they built a kibbutz. And then he went to uh, serve, but then, sorry, then um, his father came to visit him in 1938. He never saw his, uh, his mother or his sister again. They were left in Poland. His father came to visit and then he saw 
the beautiful structure that my father had established for himself in Israel. He went back to bring his family, but it was already too late. World War II had broken out uh, by the time he, he was setting up to do it. And then this boy who had established himself as an, uh, in agriculture in Israel turned into a professor at the Hebrew University where he was uh, a renowned bacteriologist and he established the Department of Molecular Biology at the Hebrew University. But what he was most proud of and what uh, really is what defines him was his teaching. He was a remarkable teacher and he takes credit and many people credit him for establishing the uh, pre premier group of uh, molecular biologists in Israel today. Um, and when I was looking to decide what I'm going to do, I did a postdoc at Stanford University and I needed to decide where are we going? What's the next step in life? Where do we move to? My father said uh, a, a sentence that will stick with me and kind of defines who I am forever. He said, if you go back to the Hebrew University, the impact you will have will be so much larger than any other place you go in the world. You can go to very good universities in America and you'll be a small cog in a big machine. But at the Hebrew University, the ability for you to impact your society, the, nobody will tie your hands. You'll be completely free to implement any crazy idea you have and, and do whatever you want in order to make change in society around you. And that's so much more important than just focusing on your science. So that's where I'm coming from, that's where our center is coming from, that's a perspective that is sincerely uh, true for the Hebrew University and that really defines who we are. Um, who are we at ELSEC? We're a group of not, not many, 30 investigators who come from a variety of different disciplines uh, that together comprise what is going on in neuroscience today. So we study from the molecular genetic cellular level through the level of uh, neural circuits and obviously you can see that some people here show more than once. Uh, then uh, a study at the level of uh, uh, structures in the brain. These are people that work in what's called non-human primates, or in other words, monkeys. And then we have uh, scientists who work in only in people, uh, that do a lot of uh, MRI work and other imaging modalities in people. And there are people, scientists, that stay only within the realm of ideas and formulas and theories, uh, the group of theoreticians. So together, what uh, our objective in this center is to bridge between all these different disciplines so that in one project we can look from the level of the molecular and cellular nature of how things happen in the brain all the way to a very large theory that relates to cognitive science in people. And uh, we're, we're doing not bad in that, and that's also really touches on the topic of, of what we're talking about today, which is addiction, where I want to show you how we can go from understanding the synaptic level, the very small level, that gives us insight into how the brain functions on a global uh, level. <coughs> Okay, now let's talk science. So uh, we'll start off with one quote: uh, "Chains of habits are chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken." Does anybody recognize uh, whom, or anybody have an intuition who might have come up with this very insightful and uh, very precise comment? Einstein. Einstein is a good guess, yeah. No, it's actually somebody who's uh, he has a very good intuition into human uh, nature and human understanding. So what we'll be talking about is how the brain takes information from the environment and how it encodes this information for long-term use. Um, and that's really the answer to, to why uh, Warren Buffett can make this statement. So, 
Now let's put it in, in uh, terms of neuroscience. So the idea is that neuroplasticity underlies all adaptive behavior. And by neuroplasticity, I mean the ability of the brain to change. Our brain is a changing machine. That's what, what its, uh, its main function, or its two main functions. One is to ignore irrelevant information from the world, and the other is to take the information that's relevant, process it, and encode it in a way that it will impact our behavior in the future. And that's the second part is what's meant here by neuroplasticity underlies all adaptive behavior. So the ability of the brain to modify itself is what allows us to adapt ourselves to changing circumstances and learn from our experience. And we can see this, it's very easy to conceptualize this when we think of young children that are beginning to interact with the world. They start touching inanimate objects, even somewhat obsessively testing what objects feel like, how their, what their texture is. They test interactions with their peers, pulling hair, making mommy go nuts. They all are always testing how, when they modify a situation, what the uh, circumstance, how it will change. And in that way, they're implementing structures through which they'll understand the world. And they're also creating these routine um, ways of interacting with the world, these almost automatic structures that they can then use to interact with the world, which could also form habits and dangerously can also form compulsions. These are all along the same spectrum of the same neural basis for how information is encoded in the brain and we'll look into those details very soon. So it's easy to think about this also when you think of normal uh, habitual structures being made where this uh, child learns that uh, she should wash her hands because her mother tells her to. And then she defines this as a structure that she starts associating with her daily life. And you can also, in this example, think of how a small shift in the establishment of this adaptive behavior could become compulsive. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how that can happen, how you can shift from an adaptive behavior to a compulsive behavior. Another place where it's very easy to think about this is how we create habits around food. We uh, have, each of us has their own bag of uh, preferences in relation to food. Some of us wish that they were different in certain circumstances in how we interact with food. And a lot of this comes from the innate structure of our brain, what it identifies as important substances that, we, that it wants us to consume. And overlaid on that, the social aspects of how we're taught to interact with the world and what is available to us. And all this creates, at the end, is this type of structure which is sometimes very difficult to break, of autom almost automated behaviors where you uh, have access to a certain food substance and it's more difficult than you would want to inhibit yourself from taking it. Is this clear so far? Okay. So the term plasticity we owe to the uh, great physician and philosopher William James who uh, coined the term in 1897, what he said is man is born with a tendency to do more things than he has ready-made arrangements for in his nerve centers. And then he coins the term plasticity. And he says plasticity means the possession of a structure weak enough to yield to an influence, but strong enough not to yield all at once. Basically, my interpretation of these uh, words are that there's something in the brain that allows us to incorporate these masses of information that are um, coming at us from the world at any given point in time. We do disregard most of the information, but a lot of it we do incorporate. And we incorporate it in a way that we can still incorporate more information as we go along. So there's some structure there that allows us to, uh, to take this information, but it doesn't collapse from too much information. 
Then he adds a very beautiful word of warning. He says, could the young but realize how soon they will become mere walking bundles of habits, they would give more, give more heed to their conduct during the plastic state. So what William James is saying is that we, he's recognizing the fact that our brain is extremely good at uh, recognizing associations and creating automated behaviors. And this is crucial for everything we do in life. It's crucial for me to be able to stand here and do something as complicated as talking while I'm reading the text, while I'm trying to communicate in a social way with you in the audience. And I wouldn't be able to even begin to do this if my brain didn't simplify everything and give me these automated chunked responses that it just pulls out when they're needed. Okay, so this is like when I'm, every, every time I move my hand, my finger, this takes a lot of effort from different brain structures to coordinate the motion of the different muscles. Obviously when I'm speaking, this takes enormous coordination of many, many muscles. All this needs to be automated and created into sequences that can be pulled out in a very effective way. And this translates to larger and larger things in life. It translates also to how you, when you open the fridge, what you'll turn to. That's also automated in many ways. It, uh, if somebody cuts you when you're driving down the road, somebody uh, uh, drives in a non-careful way, this creates in you an automated response. All of these are, we learn them, we acquire them throughout life and they define who we are in a large extent. Okay, one last quote for, that says the same thing, just again in a very elegant way, comes from Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, and he says, man can do what he wills, but cannot will what he wills. So again, saying more or less the same thing in my mind, where there are these structures that are there and they can be pulled out in an automated way, Luckily for the women in the audience, you don't have this problem. It apparently only relates to men, or at least that's what they thought in the 19th century. So where does all this sit? Uh, so if we look at the brain and we look inside the brain, we see this uh, structure that's built of 100 billion neurons that uh, come in many different flavors. There are hundreds of different types of neurons. All of them interact between uh, themselves. Uh, I'll use a pointer from the computer. Uh, in these synapses, which are the structures through which uh, brain cells communicate. And in these synapses, you have a pulse, an electric pulse coming from one cell that then defines the release of a neurotransmitter that's taken up by the cell next to it, and this transfers the information between them. And it has been uh, accepted over the past 30 years that a lot of how memory, how information is encoded in the brain is through changes in the transformation of information between these synapses, the input that comes from one cell and how it goes to the subsequent cell. So here again we're looking on the top is what's called the presynaptic neuron, where you see the electrical pulse coming in. And on the bottom you have the postsynaptic cell through that binds this neurotransmitter and then translates that into uh, another electrical pulse. These synapses can be potentiated, where for the same amount of information coming in, you get a larger response in the responding cell, in the cell to which it's transmitted or they can be depressed and you get a smaller impact. And the thought is that for any bit of information that our brain is encoding, we have this landscape of interactions between cells changing, fluctuating. And that's what I meant also when I was saying that your brains are not going to be the same when you came in and when you left. Now, when you're learning this information, the physical structure of your brain is changing in order to encode this information and keep it there. And it's changing. Some of the synapses are becoming stronger. Some of the synapses are becoming weaker. When you were 
speaking to somebody before while having a glass of wine, this information is encoded and even the association between the wine and the social circumstance is encoded and we'll also talk about where that happens in the brain. So this is the ground truth. This is what we think happens for any bit of information that comes into the brain. Today we're talking about habits and compulsions and addictions and this brings us into the reward circuitry. Here we're looking at a section through the brain of a mouse, not very different from our brain in this orientation. So the nose is uh, here on your left and the back of the brain is on your right. And in the reward circuitry, a central integrator in this reward circuit is called the nucleus accumbens, which receives a number of inputs. And so this, why, why do we need a reward circuitry in the brain? We need it for anything that we're going to do that requires motivation. You need it to eat, you need it to have sex, you need to, to get out of bed in the morning, and you need it to be able to sit here and not collapse into yourselves. The reward circuitry is what is uh, maintaining you throughout life, and it's also what al allows you to acquire habits and uh, create these chunks of information that I was talking about. So these inputs into the nucleus accumbens, we have this input from the prefrontal cortex, which is this very small part of the brain in the front here where there's actually the idea of a conscious thought, of a executive control, this small part of the brain which actually belongs to you, through which you're trying to control the rest of the brain, sometimes succeeding, sometimes a little less so. The other major input into the uh, nucleus accumbens is from the hippocampus, which defines context. So it's what is describing to the brain now this area that you're in, uh, both the physical space and the other elements of context. And then another important input is from the amygdala, which defines the emotional or stress level of the organism. Then there's a really important input of dopamine coming from this region called the ventral tegmental area. What dopamine does is it defines valence. And valence is the quality of an experience, whether it's a positive experience, a negative experience, and where it sits on the spectrum. And dopamine is what defines for your brain and for the encoding of an experience, this is a good experience, you want to repeat it. Now you can already start thinking how that would relate to anything that happens to you and how dopamine can relate to the formation of compulsions and the formation of addiction. <laughs> so let's look a little bit about the uh, cognitive science of habit formation. So when we're talking uh, differentiating them from goal-directed behaviors. Goal-directed behaviors are situations where you have a stimulus and you have an outcome, in this case uh, a light switch, and your response to the light switch is to flick it on so that you have the outcome of turning on a light and then there's light in the room. That's a goal-directed action. You know the consequence of the action you're going to take. This can become habitual when you have what's called uh, outcome, yeah, outcome devaluation or contingency degradation. So let's say you go into, you walk into a room, you're used to switching on the light. But there's already enough light in the room. There's no need to switch it on anymore, but you still will. That's habitual. That's a habit. The relationship between the stimulus and the outcome became decoupled. And there's no effect really of you turning on the light, but you still will turn it on. The, turn it on because it's already been ingrained as a habit. And that's where the connection to these frontal areas of the brain have become dimin diminished, and you have less control over the decision that you're going to make this action or refrain from making the action. Okay? I have a sense that... Uh, yeah, everybody's still with me? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. 
Um, another way in which uh, behavioral sequences can become habits or routines is uh, again in this, like in the situation that we discussed before with the uh, stimulus being a dirty hand and then the response is to turn the tap on, wash the hand, and dry it, and then the outcome is a clean hand. Within this uh, uh, sequence of events, there's this middle part, which is a continuous thanks, a continuous uh, sequence that can be completely independent of both the stimulus and the outcome. It can become rewarding in its own right, where it just becomes an action that reinforces itself and it loops in on itself being disconnected both from the input, the stimulus, the information that says the hand is dirty, it should be washed, and the outcome that the hand is clean. There's no recognition of the uh, fact that the hand is clean and there's no need for the stimulus to be there. And we, we have this loop. Okay, now let's come to the big actor of, uh, of this evening, uh, drug addiction. So it's not uh, that well appreciated, I think, even though there's a lot of discussion in society, it's not fully appreciated the extent to which uh, addiction is the most prominent neuropsychiatric disorder which causes the largest number of deaths in society out of any other psychiatric disorder and has the largest impact on society in terms of the money that it consumes to just control addiction and, uh, and throw all the people in jail who are, if the only reason they're in jail is because they're addicts and they're, they are uh, in, in a mentally deficient situation. They have a mental disorder. All of this takes a huge toll on society. So this is just data from the World Drug Report in 2010 saying that uh, uh, there are 250 million people used illicit drugs in 2007 and it just shows the description of different drugs around the world. Um, other statistics, and this is again, this is not my research. I, you know, this is information that is publicly available. Um, Last year, 2.3 million young Europeans used cocaine, which is one of the major drugs that we study in the lab. And uh, NIDA, the US National Institute on Drug Abuse, estimates that 1.4 million Americans suffer from cocaine addiction. Now, the definition of cocaine addiction or of addiction period is a severe definition. In order to be clinically defined as addicted to a drug, it means that you're willing to compromise on almost anything that is normally important to you. You're willing to compromise on family, you're willing to compromise on your job, on your quality of life in any aspect, and you're single-mindedly concentrated on trying to get the drug. So 1.4 million people in America alone are single-mindedly oriented on trying to get cocaine, not a trivial, uh, not a trivial issue. But cocaine is only part of the picture, and uh, I'm sorry for all the text. There's the major uh, problem now, in America at least, is uh, opiate addiction. Um, an opiate addiction is a very sad story of uh, commercial interests, uh, lobbying, and uh, financial corruption basically on the part of the company that uh, started off with very good intentions. Um, there was a bit of text here that I did want to share with you. Uh, well, I don't remember, it doesn't, probably not important. So just a little bit about the opioid uh, epidemic now that's uh, especially severe in the United States, but many efforts are made on the part of the company that's responsible for it being a major aspect of life in America to propagate it and make it a problem of many other countries. Uh, and here, what, what I, the, my title here is The Road to Hell is Paved with Semi-Good Intentions. 
So the story goes that in uh, 1996, this company, Purdue Pharma, that belongs to the Sackler family, which the Sackler family are huge philanthropists that have given enormous money to many different institutes in art and in science and uh, have really contributed a lot to, to this field. They also have this company which uh, is uh, very much responsible for their wealth. And they introduced in 1996 a, a OxyContin, which is an opioid, an artificial opioid, which was uh, given for treatment of uh, pain. But they were extremely good at marketing this opioid, and uh, what they got was a decision by the government that this opioid would, um, would be allowed to be given twice a day. So in principle, it lives in the body for 12 hours, and then you take another dose. In practice, that wasn't the case. And many people, within a few hours after taking the first pill, started to feel withdrawal, which is a significant issue when you're taking uh, opiates. That's, you don't have that with cocaine. You don't feel physical withdrawal. With opiates, you have very severe physical withdrawal. But they didn't have enough drug to get. They weren't subscribed enough. So they tried to get it in different ways, and uh, this would happen through illicit drug markets that were also probably benefited by, the, by this company. And, uh, um, but again, the good intentions here did exist. This was, there was a huge uh, need for pain medication that's, that's effective, and this answered that need in a very good way. It just came with a problem that wasn't as innocent as, uh, as they would like it to be. So here is 1996, and this is the use of oxycodone, which is uh, what is put in these, um, in these drugs, in oxycontin, and it just erupted. So there were uh, many prescriptions being written for this compound, and people became dependent on it, and addicted to it, and died because of use of, uh, of this drug, but more so, they died of heroin. And uh, in this graph you see the use of the, the deaths of heroin until 2010, 2009, 2010. In 2010 the company released a, uh, a similar compound to, Oxycont to Oxycontin, but just this one you couldn't abuse it. You couldn't snort it, you couldn't uh, inject yourself with it. And what happened? you have an enormous rise in the deaths from heroin because these people now cannot abuse the drug that they could buy from the physician. They have to go out to the street and uh, obtain heroin. Heroin isn't as clean as the drug that's sold by the pharmaceutical companies. And you end up with uh, many uh, overdoses from heroin. Now this is all old news. The new uh, drug of fancy is fentanyl, which is uh, relatively easy to produce. It's 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine, and it's really erupting both in its, uh, in, in, uh, its manufacturing and in the number of people that are uh, taking it and dying from it. Uh, we're starting to work with fentanyl. Sorry, you want to take a picture? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we're starting to uh, work with uh, fentanyl ourselves in the lab, in mice. Um, and this, I'm, I bring this just so you see uh, what it looks like when a mouse is given access to fentanyl. So it starts taking the drug and then you increase the dose and it takes a lot more and you increase it more and then it erupts completely. And if you allow it continued access, it will overdose. Very, very simple. Okay, so uh, we were speaking about the reward circuitry and we were speaking about dopamine and its crucial role in valence and why it's important to motivate us to do anything we want to do in the world. But this is also the target of drugs of abuse. So cocaine 
delays the removal of dopamine from the synapse. Dopamine is released, as I, we spoke about before. And cocaine <coughs> blocks its uptake. Normally, it's just retrieved from the synapse very quickly. It doesn't hang around a lot. Once you take cocaine, then dopamine stays around in the synapse. What you're going to get is a high, but you're also going to create very strong associations with what you're currently doing, which means that you're creating associations with everything that has to do with the experience of the drug, all the drug paraphernalia, all the social circumstance, all your emotional circumstance that's associated with that moment in time that you're taking the drug. And all drugs of abuse uh, affect dopamine availability. So cocaine and amphetamine inhibit the uptake, but alcohol, opiates, and benzodiazepines inhibit inhibitors of neurons that release um, dopamine. Opiates can also mimic the effects of dopamine, and uh, nicotine can increase the release of dopamine. So now I'd like to share with you a story. Now we're, this was again all introduction. Now we're getting to the science. Uh, and the science that I want to tell you about now is in large part of the contribution of a scientist who works maybe 10 minutes from here in the University of Geneva. His name is uh, Christian Luscher. He's a physician and a scientist. And he shared this story with me about one of his patients which demonstrates that addiction is a disease of neuroplasticity. So this is a story of a man, presumably like any one of us, successful, had a, a, a good family life, with one distinction, hopefully, that during his youth, he had fallen to addiction to cocaine. But he managed to remove himself from that circumstance in which he was addicted and develop this new life for himself, and they moved to a rural area. And this is when he contacted my friend, uh, Christian Luscher, and he told him, look, I have a problem. I'm, I, I feel now the need, 20 years after the last time I took cocaine, I feel very strongly driven to go back to taking the drug. And uh, so they tried to figure out what's going on, and they realized that uh, on his way to work, he, uh, most of the fields that he passes by are like these, where the uh, hay isn't covered in white plastic. But then when he hits these fields, where the hay is covered to white plastic, this triggers a memory in him. <laughs> and the memory uh, retrieves this automated behavior where he has very little control over it. So uh, for me, this is, it has this, I love this story because it has very many aspects. It has obviously the personal aspect where you understand this, this one individual circumstance, but as a neuroscientist, this is extremely exciting. We have something going on in the brain of this person that was embedded there 20 years in the past and can be retrieved by what looks like some, something completely innocent to take control over his behavior now in a way that he can barely control. Luckily for him, he could, and he could uh, find his way to the physician and they could understand what this trigger, where it was coming from. Now, it's your job, and we'll see how well you were listening, to look back at the reward circuitry and tell me where the synapses that we were talking about, where they might have changed in, the, in this individual who's addicted. What synapses could have changed in what direction leading to his addiction? So again, we're talking about the nucleus accumbens being the central integrator of reward, the place where the action happens and the habits are formed and especially addictions are driven. What, so there's context, what happened to context? The context of the white bed reminds him of the context. Right, so what do you expect would happen on the synapses from the hippocampus to the nucleus accumbens? Very good, they're reinforced. Yeah, so we have a strengthening of the synapses from the hippocampus to the nucleus accumbens, giving, bringing a stronger representation of this context. What else? The balance becomes positive, I suppose. Yeah, so we have a reinforcement of the uh, valence 
of this situation as well. This is, um, there is an increase in uh, dopamine associated with the cocaine experience and there's also an increase in the contribution of dopamine to the uh, representation of context in this situation. What about the executive control? It's diminished, right? We have a decrease in the strength of the synapses from the prefrontal cortex into the nucleus accumbens. We expect them to be reduced so that there's less uh, self-control. This, and, and there's one more aspect here which I didn't talk about, but is actually really important in addiction, and that's emotion. Many times what happens in addiction is that you have your first interaction with the drug, you go to a party or something, you have friends there that say, hey, try this, it's good. And then you take it and it's good fun. You go to another party and you know, try it again. It was not bad the first time, you take it again, it, it's great. Then what can happen is that you're not feeling so good someday. And you say, wait a minute, I remember this experience that made me feel so much better. And then you go and you take cocaine outside of that context of the party, but now in the context of a, a bad emotional situation, and you're increasing the, the strength of these synapses from the amygdala to the nucleus accumbens. You're increasing the connection between the negative uh, experience, the negative emotional state, and the drug. And that's when things spiral out of control. Because this synapse, it's very easy for it to become stronger, and it's very easy then to lose control over the use of the drug and just associate it with um, the, the bad emotional situation. So the, the picture that we drew here of the changes in synapses was completely inaccessible to neuroscientists to figure that out. We couldn't, it made a lot of sense, but there was no way to actually do the experiments to check this. And this is something that, again, Christian Luscher here at the University of Geneva and to Antonello Bonci at the National Institutes of Drug Abuse in the United States contributed to in 2012, 2013. And the reason that they could do the experiments then was because of the development of a really nice tool that became accessible to neuroscience. Have people heard of optogenetics? No? Good. Very good. <laughs> so let, let's, let's talk about it. So optogenetics is a tool that allows us to control the activity of neurons with light. We can, uh, there's a channel that's expressed in these... Photosynthetic green algae, uh, like the... Uh, we don't need her to talk about it. Uh, so these are algae that uh, express this channel in their membrane, and you can see that now there's blue light given here, and all of them start swimming in one direction, away from the light. So all of these uh, algae express this um, channel on their membrane that responds to blue light, and in response to blue light, it changes how the cell reacts. And in those situations, it causes them to flow away from the light. But we can take these channels and put them into neurons. And now the neurons will respond to light when we shine it on them. And in this way, we can control circuits in the brain. And um, let me move forward. And one of the experiments that we can perform is um, optogenetic intracranial self-stimulation. It's an experiment in which you ask the mouse to tell you, are the neurons that, I'm, that I've expressed this channel in, that now um, have this channel on their membrane, are they reinforcing? Are they part of the reward circuitry? How much effort are you willing to put in in order to activate these neurons? And what you do is you <coughs> Uh, put this channel in certain, in the brain cells you want to study, and then you connect the fiber optic to the head of the mouse, and you allow it to either press a lever or perform an action in order to activate these cells. And I'll show you an experiment that uh, was performed in my lab with this. So here you see this mouse, it has the port on the left side and the port on the right side. The port on the left side it doesn't uh, 
have any light associated with it. On the part on the right side, whenever the mouse pokes its nose, then it gets light coming in through these fibers and they activate cells within the reward circuitry. And I think it's pretty clear that the mouse is reinforcing this activity and it's going in and activating again and again and again in order to get this reinforcement of uh, this action. Um, so and this is used for this experiment was used for what in reality? So what do we learn from this experiment? So part of the things that we can learn from this experiment are what um, here. What brain structures are involved in uh, supporting this action, this repeated action? So you want to know where in the brain does reward sit? We didn't know that, let's say, the nucleus accumbens supports reward. Mm -hmm. If you activate certain cells in the nucleus accumbens, you can now learn that that's enough in order to drive the action of the mouse, where it repeats itself again and again. If you use a similar approach, not exactly this, but you do, you use optogenetics and you record from cells within the circuit, then we can figure out what, what you all were explaining about how the synapses can change in the circuit. And that's what uh, Christian Lusher here did and uh, Antobonchi in the United States. And Christian, uh, so you see here Christian from the University of Geneva. The effect of marijuana is it's not the same as the cocaine and other drugs, like the weed. So, uh, um, let, let me get to that uh, soon, okay? I'll, uh, I get that you guys are a bit, uh, that this went a little too quickly, too, too far, but now is when it all comes together, hopefully. And if not, then I'm completely, if there are specific uh, issues that I can explain better, then I'm happy to do that. Uh, but what, what Christian's contribution here is to say, is to define a new way of treating addiction by learning from the optogenetic treatment of synaptic pathology, which now I hope you can all understand what that means. So using uh, optogenetics in order to change the activity at these synapses that we were studying, he did that. And from that, he came up with a, a method for what's called deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation is when you put electrodes into the brain of a, an individual who has a disease, and it's used extensively for Parkinson's. It's one of the most effective treatments for Parkinson's, and now it's becoming more and more used for uh, major depression and for obsessive compulsive disorder. It's highly invasive, of course. You need to implant an electrode in the brain of somebody. But he showed that if he does that in mice, then you can reverse addiction, and this is also something that's now being used. So learning from this basic science of the optogenetic manipulation of the cells in the brain of a mouse, you can then jump to a clinical use uh, through this deep brain stimulation. But as I said, this is sticking an electrode in somebody's brain, so maybe we can do it in a different way. And that's where this method comes in, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. In this approach, what people found is that if you put a magnet above the brain, and let's say you put it so we have our motor cortex here, what makes everything move, if you put the magnet above the motor cortex and you activate it, then suddenly you'll get movement. But if you put it above the frontal cortex and you now connect that with the cues that you would associate with the drug, you can regain control over your response to those cues. So this is a, uh, the contribution of this guy, Anto Bonchi, and here we're looking at how the optogenetics would work in a mouse versus this TMS in a person, and you see the circuits, some of them should be familiar to you by now. And this is a patient who's being delivered transcranial magnetic stimulation above his prefrontal cortex, while he's viewing images that remind him of drug cues. So here, I don't know exactly what he's looking at here, but this is like stuff that normally would trigger in him 
the want to go and get the drug. This could be something that looks like cocaine, it could be a, a, a needle or anything that he associated with use, his own personal use of the drug. And this is working, or at least that's what, uh, so far, it's, it's brand new, but in the past few months it appears to be working quite effectively in getting people to really reduce their, uh, their addiction. Okay, um, so I just want to show you the people in my group, which I completely did not represent in this talk. These are my heroes. I, I um, normally, w when I give a talk, I describe the work that we do. Here I didn't. So if, there's, if you have any interest in hearing about what these people have done to contribute to science, then we can uh, talk about that in the question and answer. I'll just tell you that uh, the people on the right are studying this brain region called the claustrum, which we find is important for selective attention, for this ability of the brain to allow us to ignore almost all the information that comes at us because most of it is irrelevant. If you think now, if you pay attention, suddenly you'll notice how your body feels on the chair, you can notice additional sounds that you might not have been attentive to before, you can see a lot of additional information that you are ignoring when you're trying to maintain focus on the talk, and that's what they're discovering that this brain region does. And this group on the left are looking at how information is encoded in the brain uh, through the use of gene expression networks, and this also <coughs> heavily relates to uh, how addiction is formed. Uh, so these are the people that fund us. I want to thank you for your attention. And just leave you with one, one last slide, and that's uh, hopefully you're asking yourselves, uh, or were asking yourselves at some point during the talk, how you can be involved. And there really are many, many, many opportunities to be involved in, in science. Um, first and foremost, come and visit us and uh, come and visit labs. Meet the people, hear about the work. Everybody is extremely excited to share what they're doing. Then, if you want to be involved at a higher level, then you can adopt a student. They need to get their stipends to, to pay for their housing and their food. You can adopt a project that you like. You can adopt a publication. This isn't even, uh, you know, it's a small contribution that makes a big difference. We need to actually pay journals in order to uh, publish work. You can uh, think of a workshop or adopt a workshop that uh, seems appealing to you. And there are multiple other opportunities. Support a mouse is the smallest one. That's uh, if somebody has uh, a little bit extra money. Uh, but what I think, some of these are actually places where people normally wouldn't think uh, of these opportunities of like develop, well of course supporting a mouse is not something that you might have thought of, but also developing an interdisciplinary center that's aligned with your interests where you come up with an initiative and you want to drive it. Many times there are many places that would be extremely... So basically, science involves people, equipment, experimental subjects, meetings and collaborations, and there are many, many, many ways and levels at which you can be involved. All right, I'm done. So, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you.